Hello everyone, this is Enemy Stand User, and today we will be taking a deep dive look into the principles of Jujutsu Kaisen and all the abilities sorcerers have at their disposal to become strong. All of them. This video isn't really going over individual powers like specific curse techniques as that would take too long, but more of a full run through, a full guide to the complete power system in Jujutsu Kaisen and what abilities sorcerers and curse users could unlock. I'll do my best to explain all the abilities properly and accurately to the best of my own ability and more or less things will progress from basic to advanced jujutsu. There will also be timestamps in the description for y'all to look through. But let's dive into the complete principles and power system of jujutsu kaisen. All right, let's first go over the principles of jujutsu and the foundations for being sorcerers. Just basically how all this works. A slight intro to the world building of JJK with laws and history of a sorcerer. I really won't go too deep, but there again will be timestamps for everything if you want to do skip some parts. But these are the principles of JJK, so listen up brothers, this is Jujutsu Doctrine. Jujutsu sorcerers are wielders of unique supernatural abilities who make a living through exercising curses. This traces the history of Jujutsu sorcerers. The history of those who protect the weak, keep curses in check, and make a living from exorcisms. The curses created alongside humans with awakening super egos had always caused widespread torment and damage. However, a group of people who hunted curses with systematic use of Jujutsu eventually emerged. This was the birth of the Jujutsu Sorcerer. They protected non-Jujutsu Sorcerers and acted in the shadows during history's darkest moments. Countermeasures to protect the future of Jujutsu Sorcerers from the lure of evil wrongdoing. As mentioned previously, there are humans with potent cursed energy other than those born into the one of the three noble houses or a family of Jujutsu Sorcerers. However, for those who don't know what cursed energy is, a life in which curses are visible is one of a living hell. And that is not all. Even if they are able to utilize their cursed energy, to possess a power that is seen different from others increases the risk of being pulled into a path of wrongdoing. Thus, the establishment of Jujutsu Technical Colleges also functions effectively as a strategy to counter the outbreak of curse users. These are the principles sorcerers follow for the most part and what they roughly base their belief and sense of justice in. Jujutsu has been established since the Nara period, ever since Lord Tengen came in around 1200 years ago and set out the principal course shamans should make in their lives. This belief and the founders in it formed the Jujutsu society that we see today. And now in modern times, they have a school system in place called Jujutsu Technical College to guide young shamans and create new sorcerers for the next generation. On the other side of the spectrum, we have curse users. These are people who have lost their way, using Jujutsu for evil or for their own benefit, often using their powers to kill other people. These people are treated as criminals and under Jujutsu law are to be executed. Both Jujutsu sorcerers and curse users are alike in the fact that they are all shamans. They have been blessed with supernatural powers. Some may argue that shamans are the next stage for humanity, but how they choose to use their power is ultimately up to them. The only reason shamans exist and have this power in the first place is from the simple fact that they are from Japan. Lord Tengen has based himself in Japan, and because of his barriers set in place in the country of Japan, sorcerers and cursed spirits are born. Tengen can optimize the cursed energy inside these barriers to maintain balance and keep the threat of evil and curses in check from spreading. This is the basis for Jujutsu. So let's get into the fun part and break down and explain all the abilities shamans can unlock to expand their arsenal and become strong in Jujutsu Kaisen. The very first skill we have is a shaman's ability to manifest cursed energy. Now in the scope of the world of Jujutsu Kaisen, there are three types of beings. Number one, non-sorcerers, regular people who have cursed energy leak out of them with negative emotions and feelings. Number two, shamans who have the ability to control cursed energy and keep it from leaking as to allow cursed energy to flow within them, giving them powers. This varies from case to case as some people are better suited as sorcerers than others and can even see curses. And number three, we have cursed spirits which are strong entities made out of cursed energy born from the negative emotions of humans like fear. 
But for shamans, when they learn to use the cursed energy properly and train it, they are capable of fighting cursed spirits. The first basic step as a shaman is to use cursed energy. Cursed energy flows from negative, intense emotions that emerge from inside a shaman as aura. Each person has different cursed energy levels, and the more a shaman has, the more freedom they have to use their fighting techniques like curse techniques and to amplify their body with aura. I should point out that this is the more basic use of cursed energy, but for advanced high level shamans, their cursed energy could actually reflect their personality or individual power that they have. In more recent chapters of JJK, we've seen that shamans like Hajime Kashimo can manipulate his cursed energy like electricity and attack with it, and Hakari Kinji, his cursed energy is rugged and coarse, so his strikes are more painful and sharp. Then we have shamans like Yuda and Ishiguri Ryu, who have so much raw levels of cursed energy that they can fire it off in a powerful shot, like some explosive beam attack. These are some really high level uses with cursed energy, but there are still more practical ways to manipulate it. Many shamans opt to reinforce their physical body and strengthening one's flesh to hit harder or defend themselves. You can even use cursed energy to lift greater loads, we're talking tons, like in Megumi's domain battle. Manipulating cursed energy can even let you imbue tools and weapons as well, making them do more damage. Heck, you can even pick up rocks and charge it with cursed energy and throw it as a weapon. Cursed energy lets you stack your physical prowess and overhaul basic strength as humans, basically becoming superhuman for some. There are even rare cases like for Yuji, who can use his cursed energy and manipulate in a way to flow at different rates in his body, creating a delayed impact with his powerful hits. This is called Divergent Fist. Cursed energy manipulation can be used in a variety of ways and is one of the key assets to a sorcerer's ability. Now we have Taijutsu, which is the most practical and practice ability for all shamans. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is crucial in this line of work, and there is no shortage of shamans who use basic Taijutsu along with their cursed energy and cursed technique. Taijutsu is just hands. It's basic hand-to-hand -hand combat application, and most sorcerers who wish to become peak often practice Taijutsu to improve physically and become monsters in battle. There are currently only a few named combat practices in JJK. One of them is called Taito Martial Arts, which is practiced by Yuji Itadori as he uses moves like Manji Kick, but there are multiple fighting styles in JJK. Even post Shibuya Maki used a style called Shiranui Gata style, which is common among sumo wrestlers. So it's awesome that sorcerers utilize everything they can and Taijutsu mixed with cursed energy control and cursed techniques are the real deal. Shamans might not even need a special power to be strong, as people like Toto, Yuji, as well as Maki are heavy Taijutsu users and are very solid sorcerers in their own right. Next up we have Cursed Techniques. These are the most varied abilities between sorcerers and are widely used among shamans. Cursed techniques are a shaman's individualistic manifestation of their cursed energy in some type of form, albeit a physical, metaphysical form like creating manifestations from cursed energy like fire, blood, or weapons, or a conceptual form like a certain rule or an idea that affects reality. Often a cursed technique has to do with manipulating something in reality, in some type of way, like Gojo's Limitless manipulates space. Megumi's 10th shadow can manipulate and use shadows as a medium. Ghetto can manipulate cursed spirits, and Mahito can manipulate the soul. There's a great amount of skill required to manifest cursed techniques, and it's stated that techniques depend on 80% of a user's innate talent. So for the most part, sorcerers are born with their gift and their aptitude towards sorcery. Now it can be a bit much, but techniques can be separated into two basic categories. Innate techniques, and inherited techniques. Innate techniques are techniques where sorcerers or curses have a power that is manifested on their own, not connected to anything. These techniques are generally widespread among shamans 
And one downside from it is that the user has to learn how to use it on their own. They have to train it, they have to nurture it, the power so that they can grow stronger and unlock future, more advanced applications. Some examples are the calamity curses, disaster powers, flame, tides, and plants, Sukuna's slice and cleave, Nanami's ratio technique, and Toto's boogie woogie. Now, inherited techniques are the same principle. However, these powers are passed down from generation to generation, from blood family members. These techniques are especially powerful as they are coveted and specified from the families as the best of the best. The really good thing about these techniques is that there is a sort of manual that comes with them for its use and likely what abilities and steps users have to make to unlock more advanced applications. The downside to this is that other opponents might be privy to that info and know what moves you have. Some examples are Gojo's Limitless, Kamo's Blood Manipulation, Zenin's Projection Sorcery, and the Inumaki's Cursed Speech. Cursed techniques truly are like a manifestation of a shaman's creativity, their will, and individual skill set, and there are a multitude of ways to alter the powers using cursed energy amplification, cursed energy inversion, and so on, with high level abilities we'll get to later. Revealing one's hand is also another level to a curse technique, as it can act as a move to impact the flow of a battle. In a sorcerer battle, it's not just a fight, it's a war of information. Knowing or not knowing something about a person's technique is vital and the difference in life or death. Revealing one's hand is a vow when a sorcerer explains their technique to another sorcerer. So when they explain their power, the technique becomes even more effective. There is also use in misleading or lying about information verbal or visual, like Nanami's blade being blunt and wrapped, but still able to slice through things like a cleaver. A lot of smart and skilled shamans make a note to lie or reveal their technique to get the best results out of a sorcerer battle and the outcome is devastating. Their technique gets a boost and misinformation can lead to victory. There is no greater example than this than at the end of Shibuya where Mahito was fighting Yuji in that peak moment. Mahito was rattled by Yuji's divergent fist and in that decisive moment, Toto clapped with his missing hand causing Mahito to think that they switched with Boogie Woogie when really he just got psyched out and mixed as Mahito is wide open for attack and defeated by a final black flash. Revealing one's hand is definitely an underrated factor that not a lot of fans consider but it is awesome in the scope of this power system. Now we move on to binding vows. Binding vows are considered by all sorcerers to be one of the most essential skills in Jujutsu sorcery. Binding vows are essentially contracts created through cursed energy that an individual can make with oneself or another person. The act of abiding by these rules and restrictions agreed upon in these contracts can result in greater power or the achievement of a certain goal, but breaking a binding vow has an uncanny repercussion. A shaman can create self-imposed restrictions with binding vows to help them in a battle, like when Anami limited his cursed energy until overtime where his power was swelled and his cursed technique was boosted. Another example was when Sukuna made a binding vow to shrink his domain's range from 200 meters to 140 meters, allowing Megumi to stay safe, and as a result, his technique's effectiveness was improved and the sure hit sliced the entire area to oblivion. These vows are very useful but have downsides when a contract is failed. Us readers have not really seen how this works yet, but even an experienced sorcerer like Kenjaku was really not too privy on messing with the laws of Jujutsu through a binding vow contract. The next skill is Black Flash. Black Flash is a phenomenon in Jujutsu that happens when a sorcerer's control over their own cursed energy reaches its peak and they enter a zone similar to athletes. This causes a distortion in space when cursed energy is applied to a hit within one millionth of a second. The cursed energy flashes black and the strength of the hit is 2.5 times greater than a normal attack. This skill requires immense amounts of potential and combat prowess to pull off, and not a single sorcerer alive can achieve this move at will. Once black flash is unlocked, 
even for only one time, the user has entered the next level in terms of their cursed energy control and their understanding over cursed energy as a whole has reached entirely new heights. Users enter a sort of nirvana as sorcerers and are enhanced by their heightened physical prowess and control. Some have even reached 120% of their potential as fighters. The current record is four consecutive black flashes held by Yuji and Anami Kento respectively, and there are currently seven users of Black Flash, six confirmed users, and one user I'm particularly skeptical about being Yuta Akotsu. In the manga, Yuta has never used Black Flash to our knowledge, but in the J JJK Zero MAPPA film, MAPPA actually added a scene where Yuta performed the ability. I'm definitely not putting it past Yuta to have Black Flash as well, but nothing is really set in stone with the manga, but tell me what y'all think about that but black flash though is such an amazing power and it really sets the divide between high level sorcerers and their understanding of cursed energy taking them to the next level but now moving on to some seriously advanced jujutsu brings us to reverse curse technique and the application of positive energy to jujutsu all right so jujutsu primarily is based on negative energy and emotions and all the cursed energy and curse techniques use this negative energy to function now on the other hand there are very select few sorcerers who are able to construct positive energy from reverse curse technique negative energy is primarily for killing and cursing so it doesn't heal human bodies however when sorcerers take two negative sources of cursed energy and multiply it we get a positive energy for healing human flesh so energy that once destroyed becomes energy that creates this power sounds very simple but reverse curse is regarded as being extremely difficult for sorcerers to use and there are only a handful of users only seven confirmed so far there are even fewer people who can utilize the positive energy to affect other things other than themselves like for healing other people or like Yuta Okotsu did to attack cursed spirits with positive cursed energy and in even rarer cases like a sorcerer with Gojo could manipulate reverse curse in a way to affect their curse technique. This process is called curse technique reversal. So by applying positive energy to the effects of said technique it will be reversed. In Gojo's example, he used the effects of Limitless creating a new positive energy within it, making a new infinity that pushes using positive force. It's not really known how other shamans can use reverse curse in their techniques, as in Gojo's example with his technique, it's more direct. It's more like a tangible force, being that Gojo literally has three infinities. Blue is the negative force that equals pull, neutral infinity, and the red is the positive force that equals push. So it's pretty straightforward in that aspect uh, for how it's used in his case compared to how other shamans might implement reversing their techniques effects. So it should also be noted that to clear up a little bit of confusion that reverse curse is used to heal human individuals, meaning that cursed spirits cannot use reverse curse technique as not to destroy themselves with positive energy. Remember that spirits are made up of negative energy, so all they need to do is reinforce their body with the already negative cursed energy to heal themselves. But reverse curse is a very useful tool and can even undo the effects of a curse technique like idle transfiguration which manipulates the soul so it's very deep. Reverse curse is really important for sorcerers to survive this harsh world of curses, but few can actually attain and learn this ability. Moving on back to techniques though, we have extension techniques. Extension techniques are a power, an attack, or a move that originated from a user's innate technique. They're basically like named attacks. The base technique cannot change in any way. However, a sorcerer can create a variety of auxiliary kind of accessory powers to suit their specific fighting style. For example, Chozo's blood manipulation has the same concept. However, he has named attacks with moves like supernova blood meteorite and red scale and anami has a ratio technique that cannot change but he can use a move like technique collapse these moves are like extra skill sets for sorcerers to fit their specific fighting style and reflect the original power there is one more step though as we move on to our next skill maximum techniques 
These are innate techniques that have been adjusted to perform at maximum output, meaning that they hit freaking hard, and it is regarded as being the technique's most supreme art. Outside of domain expansion, these are the most powerful attacks sorcerers can do. There are currently only three techniques given this title, being Ghetto's Maximum Uzumaki, Iso's Maximum Wing King, and Jogo's Maximum Meteor. All these powers are derived from the original respective techniques and have the most output outside of a domain expansion. Next, we are entering the more accessory abilities in the series that sorcerers use to get an edge in battle. First off, we have Shikigami. Shikigami are curses that are tamed or summoned by a user to serve and protect shamans. You could say that Shikigami is like a sort of conjuration to summon a familiar to fight for you. These tamed curses don't necessarily need a curse technique to summon, but may require some sort of medium or vessel to manifest through like a talisman or some sort of seal. The curses generally carry out orders the master gives them and disappear when the technique is released or they are defeated or overwhelmed. Shikigami are generally used by Shikigami users such as Megami Fushiguro who uses shadows as a medium to summon through them. These curses usually are required to be defeated and tamed first before they can be used. It can be noted that high level curses like Jogo, Dagon, and Kuorushi have been seen using Shikigami curses to some extent in their attacks. So from low to high levels, from human to curse, Shikigami are very useful assets and a very good resource to use in battle. Moving on to curse tools. Curse tools are weapons that are specifically imbued with a curse, allowing them to be used according to the user's will to extinguish curses and decimate enemies. Curse tools are extremely useful and can be used by all shamans in all types of situations with all different levels if they have proper training. This also includes non-sorcerers like individuals like Maki and Toji who excel at curse tool usage and master the skill. Curse tools are also given a grade by their power level or cursed ability, ranging from grade 4 to special grade. On the lower spectrum of power, we have conventional weaponry that are so reinforced with cursed energy so much that these weapons have become semi-cursed tools. Miwa's Blade is a great example of this as it was just strong enough for Maki to use it against special grade Hanami right before it broke. And on the highest end of tools we have special grade curse tools like inverted spear of heaven black rope and playful cloud these tools have special abilities manifested in them the former two black rope and inverted spear can cancel curse techniques and playful cloud can dish out pure raw power depending on the user's strength throughout the series dozens of shamans use curse tools in their battles and have found them a very effective tool along with their individual power or cursed energy manipulation. There's even cursed tools that manifest with a sorcerer's innate technique like Hagruma's cursed gavel and Kurushi's fester life blade. These cursed tools have special properties relating to the user's innate curse technique. Cursed tools truly are amazing. We've now made it to one of the best innate talent sorcerers are specifically born with, Heavenly Restriction. This is a cursed restriction that affects a shaman's cursed energy in exchange for limitations or improvements to their physical prowess and capability. Heavenly restriction is like a binding placed on a person when they are born. It is basically like an inborn quote unquote curse. For example, people born with low cursed energy would be physically gifted like Maki and even rare cases like Toji who had no cursed energy at all as a trade-off he was given a body so strong that he could tangle with special grade curses easily and vice versa with people with weak bodies like kokichi muda they were given vast extreme quantities of cursed energy reserves to use like muda's puppet manipulation it stated that muda's cursed energy range was so vast that it covers all of japan and he has copious amounts of cursed energy to use as a trade-off again Muda's body was very, very weak and disfigured, and even simple things like sunlight and eating were highly painful. There are currently only three confirmed people afflicted by heavenly restriction, Kokichi Muda, Maki Zenin, and Toji Fushiguro. In Maki's example, there was actually a bug that occurred because her and her sister, they were twins, 
Maki still had cursed energy lingering inside of her, stunting her growth and nerfing the restriction. But since Mai passed away and took the remaining cursed energy with her when she passed, only leaving a cursed tool behind, Maki's full potential is now on display and unlocked as she has strength similar to that of Toji able to break away from cursed energy and massacre the Zenin. The powers of restriction definitely have some trade-off, however it is an undeniable asset to the few afflicted and this gift literally shook the world of Jujutsu as in Tengen's words, it's like it can destroy destinies. All right, we have now finally made it to the final sections of this video regarding barrier techniques. These are some of the hardest yet most practical abilities to learn in the series as they can be used defensively to keep threats in and keep shamans alive and protected amidst heated sorcerer battles. Barrier techniques are techniques that allow the user to manifest and manipulate barrier walls. They can be used to conceal entire areas, shield the user, or trap opponents among various other uses. The barrier techniques require no innate talent to utilize and anyone with enough cursed energy can learn to put up barrier walls with enough training such as non-combatant jujutsu high managers. However, for active advanced use with barriers that are more complex, even the most gifted sorcerers could have trouble with them. Many strong shamans with innate techniques are actually not able to use barrier techniques in a practical sense. Making a barrier wall would be simple enough but trapping or specifying who is being kept in and out is a whole nother league of skill. There are currently five types of barrier techniques, including curtain, symbol domain, falling blossom emotion, domain amplification, and domain expansion. These abilities are some of the best tools in Jujutsu when used right, and shamans with proficient and even masterful use with barriers are often in the forefront of the community regarded as some of the strongest and deadliest sorcerers, curses, and curse users in the series. Starting off, we have curtains. These are the most basic form of barrier techniques. Anyone can do them if they possess enough cursed energy. However, whatever the situation is, whatever the case is, everyone follows the same enchantment. The phrase is this, emerge from darkness, blacker than darkness, purify that which is impure. Every single shaman who has drawn a curtain has used this spell with a hand sign. Curtains are dome-like black barriers that appear hundreds of meters above and around selected areas. They are primarily used for secrecy for sorcerers to handle business without outside factors coming into play interfering such as regular people civilians. Normal people are not able to enter or see curtains, however they can notice if they are being obstructed by some invisible force. As previously said, curtains can be formed at any skill level, however to be actually effective, sorcerers use curtains to keep specific things in or out. These conditions can be used to increase or decrease a curtain's effectiveness or to reach a particular goal like how in Shibuya, the curtain only trapped in civilians and let sorcerers just walk in and out. And in the Goodwill event, the curtain only kept Gojo Satoru out. These curtains typically affect things with cursed energy like people, cursed spirits, and sorcerers. And it also has a secondary effect that blocks communications with cell phone usage. Most curtains that have specific conditions are impenetrable and immune to all exterior forces, so you typically cannot just break it unless some condition is cleared or you take out the caster. There's usually some give or take conditions for when a curtain is drawn or built as to how effective the barrier is. Like for example, the stronger the barrier is outside, the weaker it might be inside, and the stronger it is inside, the weaker it is outside. And the caster's conditions could increase the barrier's effectiveness and strength, like if they wanted to say, stay inside and keep people in, or stay outside and risk an ambush, but keep people out. The main combative purpose for using a curtain is for trapping specific things inside, like curses or sorcerers, so it's a really practical technique. This also gives curtains more advanced options like stacking barriers on top of one another, which each curtain dome having different conditions for entry. 
This is a very high level usage of curtains and only a handful of sorcerers could actually pull this off. We also have extreme examples with barrier walls with the Cullen games right now and Kenjaku is said to be the second most powerful barrier user next to Lord Tengen himself and was able to create 10 citywide barriers forming the 10 colonies that we're in with recent chapters today. These barriers keep players, sorcerers, and curses inside until a player makes a rule to cross colonies. This is the single greatest use of barrier walls that we've seen besides Tengen's Veil around Japan and the hollowed lands of Jujutsu High. Curtains really are a pretty useful and convenient tools and techniques and are kind of like an intro to barrier usage. The next barrier skill we have is Simple Domain. This technique is vital. During the height of Jujutsu in the Hien era, Saratsuna Ashia created the domain for the weak in order to protect his followers from the evil curses and curse users. Thanks to Ashia, sorcerers now have a way to protect themselves from the midst of an enemy domain. Domain expansion grants the users a guaranteed hit and sometimes neutralizes their target's curse techniques. However, if simple domain is deployed within an enemy territory, the user will not be affected by the imbued curse technique or the automatic hit effect. And while the user of simple domain keeps up his barrier, even the enemy domain caster could be hit by a simple domain's attacks. Originally, this technique was only used by the Ashia clan and forbidden to spread outside of the family. However, over time in this modern age, Many sorcerers have gained this power through training and through secondhand knowledge from their masters. Many users of this technique don't even come from a family of sorcerers. The basic application of using this power is to literally create your own mini safe space, your own mini domain to protect yourself from an enemy sure hit effect in the territory. So it's more of a defensive trait. But in some cases, this simple domain can be used offensively with an ability called new shadow style this is an offensive attack that uses simple domain the two named attacks using new shadow style are bottle sword drawing and evening moon sword drawing like the name implies this is a sword drawing attack that envelops the blade in cursed energy and increases the speed of a drawing a sword and attacking targets in front of them or around said barrier there are other applications to new shadow style but we haven't seen other people use it yet other than swordsmen and Kokichi Muda using this ability. It should be mentioned that this technique only neutralizes a guaranteed hit in certain situations for domain expansions and does not cancel techniques so the user is still vulnerable to attacks slash curse techniques in and out of a domain expansion. This was very evident in Megumi's fight with Reggie Star as Reggie made a simple domain However, due to Megumi's barrier being incomplete, the sure hit effect was void, and whether Megumi's attack miss or not, it doesn't matter because his curse technique could still touch Reggie and ultimately affect him. There are currently 7 users of Simple Domain and 3 users of New Shadow Style. Simple Domain may be regarded as a domain for the weak, but individuals, when it's used effectively, it could really keep these people alive and keep shamans alive and give them a fighting chance even against enemy barriers. This next technique, Falling Blossom Emotion, is just like Simple Domain in that it is also an anti-domain countermeasure, but there are a few key differences. Unlike Simple Domain, this technique does not expand its own barrier. Instead, it uses cursed energy to shroud the user in an armor of aura that counterattacks the moment a domain's guaranteed hit makes contact. The Cursed Energy defends the user automatically, countering any attack with equal force to nullify it. It's almost like a cheat code against the domain's sure hit attacks and grants the user actual defense against curse techniques touching them. This was best displayed with Neobito Zenin's use versus Dagon's Death Swarm curse technique, and no matter how endless the Shikigami Swarm Neobito, Neobito was still safe using this secret art. His brother Ogi Zenin also used Falling Blossom Emotion, applying it to his body and his sword so that it could automatically strike anything with Cursed Energy when it comes into contact with it. 
The downside to this power is that it only defends against curse techniques, so an enemy can still hit the user with physical attacks like Dagon did in Shibuya. There are only currently two users of this technique being Neobito and Ogi, both who are Zenin. Seeing as this is a secret art, we can assume that this power is only known by few sorcerers or only spread through the Zenin's practice. The following high level technique is like a mix between Falling Blossom Emotion and Simple Domain, being Domain Amplification. This barrier technique surrounds the user in a fluid like shielded aura that imitates the effect of a domain. It neutralizes any technique it comes into contact with. It can basically shut down any opponent's curse technique. The chances of the attack missing is very likely, but leaves enemies vulnerable to attack. They cannot defend with the curse technique. This power was even an effective countermeasure to Gojo Satoru's Limitless. It truly is a broken ability. However, there is a few drawbacks for its use. First off, when a caster activates domain amplification, their own innate technique shuts off. So amplification and curse techniques cannot be used at the same time. Second, the caster could still be hit by basic cursed energy control and physical attacks. So with hand-to-hand -hand combat, nothing changes and the user could still get folded if they're not careful. And third, even when a domain amplification is active, if the opponent is strong enough, they can strengthen their curse technique and increase their output to overpower the caster. Inside of a domain, you can still cancel out attacks using your own curse technique, so the same applies here. This is exactly how Hanami died as his amplification output lost to Gojo's limitless output. Domain amplification is definitely a powerful technique, but should be used with caution because when fighting high level sorcerers, the difference between amplification being on and off can mean life and death, and only the curses Hanami and Jogo have been shown using this ability, but it is hinted that the entity known as Kenjaku taught them this, so there's potentially only three users of domain amplification. Okay, this is it brothers. We finally made it to the last and greatest barrier technique, Domain Expansion. This is the most high level, the most supreme art a sorcerer, a curse, or a curse user can reach in terms of their innate curse technique abilities and potential. Many in the series regard domains as the peak of sorcery and they give the user many of the greatest buffs and advantages in sorcerer fights and easily can turn the tables in battle. However, what really is a domain expansion? A domain expansion is a phenomenon in Jujutsu where the user can set up barriers to create a separate space, a sort of pocket dimension you could say, where the caster can trap targets and use cursed energy to construct an environment that suits said user's cursed technique. They literally influence the environment around them and their enemy to be embedded with an innate curse technique. This sort of ability requires immense levels of skill, talent, and creativity to pull off, and it actually is like creating things from nothing more than cursed energy and imagination just pulled from thin air. This is why so few shamans can pull this off because of the sheer difficulty it could be to realize your technique in this way. Now there are currently two types of domain expansions, modern style sure hit, sure kill domains, and ancient style rule oriented domains. Modern domains are designed to be lethal and kill trapped enemies. These often require a lot of skill and tons of cursed energy to perform, so it's like a finishing move. They amplify the user's curse technique to the max, so now you could say it's a situation like Black Flash where the user enters a very high state and in their zone, and in some cases, their potential could reach 120% and any curse technique the attack casters perform will be a guaranteed hit to kill. This is what most sorcerers today use. Now, ancient style domains are a little different because they are not designed to be fatal. These techniques only force enemies inside to obey the given rules of said curse technique. 
These rules are up to the caster and could seriously benefit them as they can grant the users power inside or outside said barrier or even result in weakening the opponents if the enemies can't follow the rules, fail the challenges, or fall behind in any way. We've seen Hakara use his jackpot to buff himself slash get a reward, and Haguruma can use Judge Man and the outcome of a verdict to grant him powers. These types of domains potentially have the added benefit of not draining the caster's cursed energy too much, basically allowing domains to be used more than once without consequences. Regardless of the style though, domains all follow the same principles of amplifying and embedding a curse technique in a created set barrier. Domains are like a shaman's ultimate expression of their curse technique and imagination, like an ultimate extension of their ability. For example, Gojo's Limitless Void is of course an extension of Limitless, but because Gojo is a Six Eyes user too, the effect of Six Eyes is also applied to the target as a side effect in the sure hit forcing infinite information to be overloaded into the target's brain. Domains also all come in a variety of shapes and sizes as well. Some could be small, others are quite wide and big, while in one outlier case with Sukuna, he doesn't even form a barrier at all, but sets his own perimeter with a binding vow and guarantees anything within said perimeter to get hit, actually affecting outside factors. Most of the domains are performed by a signature hand sign or a signal that acts as a natural condition to form a domain. I'm guessing that this could be a sort of vow or a visual indicator for the technique to begin. The step even more advanced than domain expansion is the domain of 0.2 seconds. This version of a domain is where the domain expansion flashes out with no set barrier for the duration of 0.2 seconds. The domain's innate ability will pulse and explode out, affecting anyone in the immediate area to where the caster sees fit. In my words, it'd be like flicking a paint off of a brush, like a splatter of a curse technique with an effective sure hit. This is really not a super practical ability as it's only used in situations where the user has to minimize a domain's effectiveness basically next to zero to avoid possible repercussions. Gojo wanted to preserve the civilians' lives, and Mahito wanted to avoid Sukuna's wrath. This ability was not, it's not super usable all the time, but it still requires serious levels of concentration, awareness, and cursed energy control to pull off. Going into some negatives now, domains are extremely peak, but still have drawbacks. The biggest drawback is how after a domain expansion is performed, or even attempted, the user will be very drained due to the amount of effort and cursed energy that was used up, so it's only like a one-time move. And as a side effect, their innate curse technique starts to act up and glitch. For some time after the domain, the caster cannot use their curse technique right, and this even affects Gojo. However, Gojo is the only confirmed person who can use domains multiple times a day. Another small drawback is the amount of countermeasures domains have. Because of the attack potency of a domain expansion, many sorcerers created ways around the sure hit with techniques that I mentioned before like simple domain, domain amplification, and falling blossom emotion. These can be a little bit tricky to deal with in the barrier and a domain master would have to handle these threats so as not to prolong the fight and keep his advantage in battle. Just to emphasize the complexity of a domain, let's consider how domain battles flow between shamans. It's stated that in a domain battle, the more superior refined domain will come out on top. This is why many sorcerers only take out their domain when they know that they've won or they wear down their enemy first and use the domain as a last ditch effort. Domains are designed to keep people in and trapped so the wall inside barriers is stronger on the inside than it is outside. So there's not really any point in breaking in a domain as you would just be trapped. In a domain, it's almost impossible to escape from inside and most people only have an option to cancel out the opponent's sure hits with cursed energy, which is a really bad idea as domain users are extremely strong in their territory. Or as an alternative option, victims can cast countermeasures or they can cast an actual domain of their own. In the case of maintaining a barrier, 
outside conditions matter. Shamans literally have to create pocket dimensions out of thin air, and if you had to do that in an enemy territory on top of their conditions, that would be very, very hard. This is why sorcerers like Megumi have, still have incomplete barriers because it's extremely hard to forming those invisible walls into reality. This is also why recently in recent chapters, we've never gotten to see that three-way domain battle because forming three individual barriers with their own curse techniques, meshing in with one another, or rather pushing against one another, would be way too unstable. Not to mention that there were other factors like intruders, like the roach that were inside, and inside and outside factors were all chaotic, and that led to the domain barrier collapsing. One domain cannot necessarily really coincide with another domain. It seems like one has to overpower the other. Unless there's a serious weak link, like in the Dagon vs Megumi domain battle, and the only thing Megumi did was deactivate Dagon's sure hit, and Megumi still had to fight for it. He had to give it his all with max effort just to maintain that. Domains really are definitely a strange, strange power in JJK as far as how they clash. They are definitely an amazing addition to the crazy abilities in JJK and serve as the peak monument of power and is the ultimate flex as sorcerers flex their barrier knowledge. There are only 13 confirmed users and it just keeps growing with Five users already revealed in the new calling game arc and our ceiling in JJK just keeps getting higher and it is awesome. You might say that that's it for all the powers, but there's actually one more thing that sorcerers have the ability to do. More specific to human sorcerers, they have the ability to curse people before death. It is said that no sorcerer dies without regret, so that negativity and resentment keeps fueling the cycle of curses even among shamans themselves. It is really unknown to what these curses could do and how they could impact the story or the world of the living, or even who could be cursed. And Mai technically cursed her sister, albeit it was more of a positive thing. And both Yaga, Masamichi, and Reggie Star cursed their killers, and many other people in the story have died and left some pretty foreboding and impactful messages behind to their fellow shamans. This is a really small aspect of the series, but I wanted to include it because this is still something worth mentioning and that is still something that sorcerers can do and really what being in this JJK world is all about. In the end, shamans just curse each other to the death, but we'll just see how things shift in the story in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen and how this modern era today will go in JJK. All right. Well, okay. I just explained all that. But this is it, brothers. Congratulations. If you made it this far, you truly are a brother. Thank you for bearing with me. And I really do hope that my explanation with all of these abilities helped you, even if it was a, have a little bit of a better understanding for the power system. And if it didn't, well, but but this this is definitely my favorite power system in recent years. And Gege has so many options and things that he makes us really think about with the power system and how it works. I like that Gege also has, he's very consistent and faithful to the rules that he puts in the JJK and it makes it, reading it so much more fun, the fights, the battles, it's just a lot more interesting and creative to read. But please tell me how y'all feel, remember the comments. I love reading y'all comments, it's super fun and all that stuff and remember to subscribe for more Jujutsu Kaisen and manga and anime related content. This was definitely a huge video for me to make and I appreciate all of it. It's super fun. I appreciate you guys support, but this is Enemy Stand User and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.